Welcome to Forbidden Planet TV. I'm Andrew. Who am I? I'm Andrew Sumner, and I'm very pleased uh, to be joined once again by two of our favourite creators, uh, the one and only Sean Phillips and the one and only Ed Brubaker. How are you guys? Fine, thanks. Great. Andrew. Thanks yeah, for great. Thanks for joining us because um, it's 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 that time again that we've got a, a new reckless book on the horizon. So follow me down as I understand it is the tale of what happens to Ethan while the events of uh, your last book, The Ghost in You, were going down, which which were where Anna was front and center. So first of all, what can you tell me about the about the plot line of Follow Me Down? It's um... This time out, well, like Anna said at the beginning that Ethan was up in the Bay Area on another job uh, at the beginning of the Ghost in You, and then you know he he appears later in the book at the very towards the very end. Um, so initially, when I thought about doing the book about Anna, that was one of the ideas that occurred to me was like, oh, what if the next book after that is this then a solo Ethan book with no Anna? That's about like oh what he was doing during that time period actually so then if you end up reading both books together they kind of add something to each other like a little bit of you know more melancholy maybe um but yeah so ethan uh has a friend in the neighborhood who's like a movie producer type who basically you know asks him if he'll go it's it's the week it's a couple weeks after the san francisco earthquake in uh, 1989 and uh, this guy's uh, daughter-in-law has gone missing. He's got a son who's like an ex-junkie and his wife is also an ex-junkie and she's gone missing just a few days after the earthquake. And everyone thinks maybe she's, you know, gone back to drugs and, and living on the streets or whatever. And so Ethan accepts this job to go up and try to search for this woman. And, and what he actually finds out is is a much more fucked up story is that the the earthquake actually sort of sparked something in her brain that that made her start to remembering a bunch of things from her past that that have been haunting her and she's sort of on a on her own sort of dark mission that he's that he starts sort of uh trying to trying to catch up to her and and save her from you know disaster basically yeah. what are your influences on this book Oh God, real life. <laughs> um, just, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, I lived in San Francisco and the Bay Area, like around the time of that earthquake, I moved up there right after that. And so I remember watching the cities, uh, Oakland and San Francisco. When I, when I moved there, the building across the street from me had just a huge blue tarp across one side of it because the entire facade had fallen off because it was old, old bricks and they were still pulling bodies off of this collapsed highway and so I really wanted to sort of get into what what life in the Bay Area sort of felt around that earthquake um, and then you know there's just been a couple two or three people that I've known in my life who've who've had these really messed up childhoods that were around the same age as me raised in like the the sort of late 60s through the mid 70s by by weird hippie parents and ended up you know having a lot of childhood trauma and stuff because of that and it's, it's something that's always haunted me about you know these different people that I've known and and I just thought it seemed like the kind of story that Ethan could get involved in that it's less of a murder mystery and and more of a revenge story in a lot of ways because of that and I thought that would be a nice change of pace from you know the the last few which have all been mystery stories yeah right on uh, okay that makes a lot of sense are you are you um I'm, i i felt uh, very strongly i certainly felt very strongly ghost in you the kind of the classic hollywood influence which is always there to some degree within the reckless books and there's clearly some film elements to the synopsis you just talked about but but for you sean with your affinity for uh, for movies and the the, the the movie work that the movie work that you do you know your your, your dvd covers for example for criterion um it, is is that something is that something that a lot you know that gives you another frame of reference you can research do you, do you really get into the research side of that um, when you're well, working I do on it? There's never enough time to do the research. Of course. Um, but for this one, I mean, the same as all, every book that Ed and I do, I never, never really know what's going to happen in the stories until I get the script. I prefer it that way. I, I've got the vague idea of what's going to happen, but not the details. 
Um, so at the beginning, because Ed said it's set in San Francisco, I went and bought the streets of San Francisco on Blu-ray to um, get some picture right. research. And then San Francisco itself is only like, for like four pages or something, isn't it? So <laughs> I, I, I was past the pilot. I thought it was going to be in it a lot more. <laughs> yeah, that's what way. So, but most of it is, um, it's always more specific than that. I've got to draw a particular thing. So that's, that's why I usually research. I don't really go for the broader influence. Yeah, it's a lot of, this one is a is sort of a road trip story in a way. And yeah, I had to cross some trees and roads and stuff. Yeah, they they even go to like the national park at one point. But yeah, it's all it's all just me looking at, at highway maps and figuring out like, oh yeah, this place and this place and like stringing them all together. But it was all it was all like Northern California, um, Bay Area, you know. But then back and forth from the coast to the border too. So yeah, Sean had to draw a lot of road trip stuff and cheap motels. Yeah, yeah. I, like, I like doing that sort of stuff. I mean, it's all alien to me. I've never been there. So, you know, it's just to draw as anything else. Yeah. One day we'll do a, we'll do a book set where I live. It'll be much easier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It'll be a trick well, Potter murders. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess if, he, if he, Ethan Reckless in 1990 takes a flight over to your part of the world, he's going to be, he's going to encounter a very different, <laughs> yeah, very oh, different yeah. strata we'll, of society. We'll, we'll do a, we'll do like a murder mystery set in the Cotswolds and that'll, that'll finally get one of our things made into a TV show or movie. <laughs> <laughs> how, Ed, how do you see, uh, so we've, we've taken, you've taken, uh, Ethan throughout the entire eighties at this point. Um, so uh, how, how do you see him having developed as a character during that period of time throughout those five books? Um, I mean, I think, especially in the fifth one, we get to see a little bit more of, of sort of who he's becoming, you know, later in life too. We get, we get, uh, some different glimpses of, you know, him grappling with, you know, the parts of, of his humanity that he can still, that he's still in touch with, I think, in this one. So I think over the course of the books, uh, the five books, we've, we've come to, you know, learn that a lot of the things that he says about himself are sort of not true. Like, he thinks that he doesn't have emotions, or he thinks he doesn't care about things, but he does actually care about all these things, and he has, like, a few a few really passionate like relationships and friendships in his life so i think you know i think in some ways he's a he's a mentally damaged guy but we watch him go through the 80s and he sort of you know he still believes these things about himself and the world but but really he's still like a guy who's trying to change things for the better for other people usually so you know he's sort of a contradiction yeah um but yeah i think uh you know, a lot of a lot of what I like about him is is what doesn't change about him. <laughs> you know, like the last scene of this book is one of my favorite things that uh, we've done in the series so far. I don't know if you did. It, did I send you an advanced copy? No, I I I, I oh, haven't, haven't seen an advanced yet. copy yet. Okay. I'd, I'd love one though. You send me one when we finish talking. I'd love to. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I I uh, well I can't wait for that. I can't wait for that. Have you? Um, I, I was thinking about the whole movie theater thing. And this might be something we've not talked about with regard to the characters before, but do you, do you, in your mind, to, to Anna and to Ethan, do they have a top 10, do they have a top 10 movie list? Oh, top 10. I mean, probably at least a top three. Right. Okay. Um, but yeah, probably both of them being like people who basically live at a movie theater, they probably do have like top 20 or 25, actually. I wouldn't be able to tell you I would I could be able to tell you which movies Anna loves that Ethan hates. <laughs> can he like, give I me doubt, a, Yeah, yeah I doubt Ethan actually, actually really likes Repo Man, but I know Anna <laughs> loves it. <laughs> I think I think Ethan's probably more inclined to like uh, you know, uh Blue Velvet or something. <laughs> yeah, true story. Um Alex Cox's mum and dad were my mum and dad's next door neighbors. Yeah, oh, wow. one of those weird twists of fate. Yeah, so for sure, you know, and uh, uh, yeah, no, he and, and uh, they, but they lived to a great old age, actually, both of them very proud of this one. But yeah, he often oh, wow. decompressed and spent a lot of his time in between movies just next door to my mom and dad. Oh, so, that's uh, cool. 
Yeah, no, it's 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 a small world after all, right? I, I like Reaper yeah. Man for the for the Mike Nesmith element. I think that's the bit that I like the most. Oh yeah, I mean, I I love that movie just because it was like one of those uh, one of those movies. It actually really captured uh, what early '80s Southern California punk rock felt like. Like it was less about clubs sometimes and more about just going to a, like someone's party where they're playing music in the back like someone's playing records in the backyard and having a pit in the grass you know like just people slam dancing outside in someone's backyard it's like you know you, you don't think about that but that's kind of what it was like to be a teenager then <laughs> what but, yeah and what? I also liked all the generic food and beer and everything yeah. yes <laughs> absolutely yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Do, you, do you, are, there, are there any other um are there any other 80s LA movies that stick out to you as being particularly authentic um I mean obviously suburbia that uh, yeah. Penelope Spears one I don't think that's a very good movie as far as the I mean they actually had like yeah. real street punk kids you know doing the acting so they all were pretty bad <laughs> but um yeah there's a bunch of there's a bunch of early 80s stuff like the document that documentaries that they made her her uh, decline documentaries are both really good for sort of recapturing that feel of it and some of the some of the 80s punk rock movies that they've made recently like the one about the germs i thought was was actually did a pretty good job of capturing the 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 way that that world kind of felt at the time but yeah, I like a, a lot of actual movies from that time period that really captured the spirit of it. There's some Jodie Foster movie called like Foxes or something like that. Oh, wow. Where, yeah, like, I remember that. Her and a bunch of her. And a, it's like her and the lead singer from like the Runaways are just sort of these teen girls who just hang out on the Hollywood streets all night. And, you're, and it just felt really real, you know, yeah. like Scott Baio was even in that. <laughs> yeah. Really. yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Have you, uh, 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 Sean? Have you put together one of your um, one of your uh, books for this edition, which uh, you know for follow me for um, uh, follow me down? Have you got one um, of your, your albums? Your sketchbook. Yeah, I did a sketchbook for every every book. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, for for working on my thumbnails and and stuff like that. But I don't really do much extra stuff. Do you, do you, I mean, do you have them all lined up there in your studio? Do you keep them? Um, yeah, they're over there somewhere. They're down there. You can't see them. I'll find it. You talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. There we go. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Again, just that, a book of. That's what I was hoping that you'd give us a, give us a squint at it, mate. Yeah. Brilliant. Oh yeah. Don't, no spoiler. Well, I mean, it's really loose. <laughs> it's <laughs> spoiler free. Yeah, because we. Yeah, you can tell exactly what's happening, can't you? Um, <laughs> oh, I know what scene that is. Working on, working on grid, it's, it's you know it's easy to uh, map out the pages. So everything I use it mostly for that for working out you know which panel goes on which tier and where will the balloons and captions go, and then the stick figures are just you know really basic. I don't need much more information than that. But yeah, I like doing it. It's, it keeps it you know, on the shelf. It's lovely. You have that physical artifact. Yeah. And yeah. It's, been, it's been great, I think, you've been able to put this series together in that format because I, what everybody responds to about them is the I was going to say, I do, I do this now on my notebooks. I have the... <laughs> Ah, the stickers yeah. <laughs> that Sean makes for the yeah. book plates. I every every time he sends a batch over, I always find at least one that he's forgotten to sign. So oh, again, I get, I get one clean <laughs> one, <laughs> <laughs> and then that becomes my notebook for for the uh, for the books or whatever the next books are. I mean, while we're talking about these, all of these book plate editions of of each edition of reckless all five editions uh the four that are out and the one we're talking about which is about to come out you can order all of those forbidden planet book plate editions from our conversation right here and uh, oh, yeah. we've, we've got a nice full set so thank you for that guys thank you for, oh, for signing those they're, they're all in stock and they're all available to buy from this interview um without going into too many or any spoilers about the conclusion of follow me down um where are you going to take uh Ethan two next is is he moving into the nineties next time around? Oh yeah, he has to, right? Yeah, well, that's... I mean, I I would I in some ways I wish I hadn't jumped so far ahead in the eighties from eighty one to eighty five between books one and two, but I figure we could also go back and do anything we want with it. But yeah, I'm trying to sort I'm trying to figure out right now like what's the what's the next 
Ethan book and what is, you know, what is the nineties for him and, and what was the nineties for me? Um, you know, I, I feel like the nineties are, are sort of, uh, that was the last half of my twenties. Uh, it was like the early nineties. And I, I feel like I, that was my, my last period of, of craziness. So I want to try and remember what it felt like to be young and wandering the West coast. <laughs> Have you got a specific region of your travels within the West Coast that you haven't explored yet? Ed? Um, not Seattle, you know, which is kind of funny because, you know, everybody was moving to Seattle in the early 90s and I did too. So I thought it'd be it'd be fun to do like an Ethan goes to Seattle book at some point. But, uh, you know, I don't want him to like try to solve Kurt Cobain's murder or anything. <laughs> <laughs> I like we all know idea. Courtney. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it writes itself. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. I was uh, I was talking to um, a big fan of your of your work actually on on the Reckless series uh, a couple of episodes ago, and that was Patton Oswalt. We we're talking about oh. his new book, Minor Threats, right? yeah. and uh, he was you know waxing rhapsodic quite rightly about the Reckless series. Uh, but he, funnily enough, he got into a very similar conversation to one that we've had in the past, which was about, uh, was actually about all of the, the John D. MacDonald books and, and how essentially that character does not travel at all well once you read him here and now in 2022. And the books are still pretty propulsive and whatnot, but what he gets up to and his attitudes are just leaping off every other page. Yeah, it's really, it's really bizarre. The ones that I feel, I feel really good about the ones that do uh, age well, you know, like Parker ages surprisingly well for a guy who kind of takes no shit and slaps people around man or woman. He doesn't, he doesn't come across as harshly sexist though, because <laughs> he kind of slaps everybody around. Um, but yeah, it's like a lot of the a lot of the old pulp characters really, really, you know, are of their of their era. It's weird, like Sherlock Holmes, of course, that comes from an era which would have been much worse on all of these issues and still somehow ages well. Yeah, no. it, was, it was written classy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's very interesting. They don't get in. It, Karen Doyle doesn't get into too much of the British imperialism stuff or any of those yeah. attitudes. They're not there. It's, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, yeah. Guys, uh, uh, we touched upon before Pulp, which has done very well for you, is very well received uh, and uh, sits firmly within this kind of idiom. The, the, the process edition has been out for a while now and, and it's available uh, It's available for order again from, from the links attached to our conversation. Uh, how do you feel about the way that turned out? Because that's been very popular with everybody we know who's read it. Oh, cool. Yeah, I think it's turned out really well. We've given away all our secrets, though, haven't we? So yeah. <laughs> well, I think the beauty of it is that you've given away all your, you've given away all your secrets, but you can't, you know, you can't give your talent away, you know. So I think <laughs> I, I think the most that you'd see is a lot of very poor replications of what it what it is you do and how you put it together. But it is fascinating to to read, knowing knowing we didn't you know, have enough energy. sections of of pictures of Sean posing in different outfits. No. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was the part that I thought yeah. later after I saw the book, I was like, you know what? That. We could add 10 pages of pictures of Sean. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I, you know, I, I didn't think of it as giving away our secrets at the time. I was, I felt weird about showing my notebook pages because no one ever really sees those. Like not even Sean usually, no. and I was worried. I was like, "Will people realize how little I actually do?" <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, I was uh, the the few reviews I've seen of it. People seem to really uh, dig it as a as a behind the scenes making of thing. Which you know, I don't think anybody's ever put out a book like that that just shows you from the whole you thing, know, yeah. from the initial like, "Hey, write a western." To here's the book. You know, and it's the perfect project to do it on because it's finite. It's not too short. It's not too long, and it's it really yeah, does right. suit that format. It's like you've taken the archival format, which is very popular now, quite rightly, but done something else entirely with it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I hope that people who teach, you know, schools about the uh, how to make comics and stuff like that, like use it in their classrooms and stuff as a example of how you know. I mean, at least that's how we do it, which I think is the right way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. of course. 
and and now that it's out, the uh, the the second Martini edition for uh, IDW second Parker Martini edition is out. Last goal. Um, what can you talk a little bit more about the story that you put together for that? We touched upon that the last time we met, but it it wasn't out yet, so uh, there wasn't a lot that we could get into. Yeah, um, yeah, that was interesting because initially Scott asked me if I if there was some part of like a Westlake book that I could turn into a short story the way Darwin had done in the first one with he took like a chapter of of the seventh I think and like I think he took the final chapter of a book and just did it as a short story and um you know I just thought I don't, I don't know that there's a that there's a piece of any of the other Westlake books that would work like that like I don't think the same way Darwin did and I was like, oh, I don't know what I could do. And then Scott said, well, what about if you just wrote an original story with Parker? And I, and then I was like, oh, is that, a, is that something I'm allowed to do? Like, and then we had to go through the getting permission phase where I basically had to sort of pitch the whole story. And almost immediately I realized like, oh, I can't do a Parker story. Like I need to do like the, the as much as I love Westlake and I love Parker, like, the stuff that I'm good at writing is, you know, not a character who is as blank as Parker is. Um, and I just thought, oh, I'll do a Growfield story. That'll be fun. And I'll make it like a tribute to, you know, Donald Westlake and Darwin. So it'll be, you know, this sort of flamboyant actor, you know, growing older and thinking about death and thinking about the death of Parker and, um, you know, his old partner. And um, so we pitched that and Initially, Parker was actually going to die in the story, and and um, uh, Abby Westlake said Parker Parker can't die. And so I thought about it again. I was like, Oh, this will be better. Actually, I have a different idea that's even cooler than that. And so we pitched that, and then I wrote the script. And you know, once she saw the script, she approved us to do it. And you know, and then Sean took off with it and did all that great like blue tone, you know like extra layer of color and it was just it was just a lot of fun he was when when I was getting the pages for that was when I started thinking about doing reckless because Sean was Sean's art was coming in for this Parker thing and the thing that I was going to start was so different than that and I just thought I want to do more stuff like this like more pulp stuff and you know and then in you know just coincidentally the comic market then shut down so yeah. you know suddenly it was like oh let's do something else and i know that 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 shutdown was a big factor in you coming up with this format and this series but it must feel like an incredible piece of serendipity now that you're, you're five books in and the series has been as well received as it has been has continued to sell so well yeah we just had to uh send the first book back to print actually the in hardback which I didn't think we printed so many of them that I was sure we'd never have to. I thought by the time we sell out, we'll at least figure out what we want to do as, as far as paperback reprints go. But we still have so many of the other four that <laughs> like, okay, well, we have to reprint it. Luckily, we can print it far uh, over in China <laughs> where printing is still somewhat affordable. Um, but uh, but yeah, the the books have have really, really taken off. But yeah, it was it was really, you know, I think that period of working on that Parker book and going back and looking at what Darwin was doing really was helpful in figuring out how to make the reckless books work in a way because, you know, I knew those books that he was adapting. So I figured, oh, okay, this is, you know, I have an idea in my head of roughly how many pages we'll need to do you know, a pulp story about the length of one of those Parker books. Um, so that was really, you know, influential. And also just, you know, seeing Sean draw those characters was, you know, I couldn't imagine wanting him to, you know, draw someone riding a dragon after that. <laughs> I, I still be bad enough it. to put him on horseback. Yeah. <laughs> That is such a beautiful book, though, mate. It's I still can't get over with all, with all of the the reckless series. It's the affinity you seem to have as somebody who's visited Los An um, Los Angeles, the West Coast, a lot. So, uh, and somebody who brings that kind of uh, sensibility of viewing it to to the artwork that you do. The fact you've spent as little time over there as you have, I find constantly amazing. When I read each new book, it feels so vibrant to me. I, I, it's, I think it's incredible that you, you, you're able to do that. I just have to, yeah, Ed gives me, 
reference some stuff if I have to draw anything specific. Re recommends you know a particular restaurant or something we I have to draw. Um, but yeah, yeah. Most, um, it's the color. The color makes it. I think a lot of it is the <laughs> tone of it. Too. Well, yeah, the color really does help add the sort of it gives it a real sort of twilight of memory kind of feel so you but also a lot of it is like finding the right location uh, you know for for a thing like a, the settings that still feel like seedy old 80s LA like a lot of places in LA don't look or feel the way that they did in the 70s or 80s and so if you can find you know good old photos or sometimes people have uploaded old like home movies that are on super eight and stuff and i'll find moments of that and freeze frame i'm like oh there's a a block of venice beach that you know looks completely seedy like it did in 1978 um you know like uh you know it's it's just there's an art to trying to capture that the the mood of a place as much as a look of a place and yeah i think jake really helps a lot but uh, but you know sean always nails those locations i really feel they feel lived in like the well, maybe the it definitely part. helps if i haven't been there and i can all of my um input from it is second hand from watching old tv shows or looking at old photos so you know i've got that yeah uh, removed. i mean if you watch columbo and the rockford files you see yeah. so much of la because they actually let them go out and film it yeah, you know, because I don't know why they, they had enough of a budget to actually film on location around the city, but they do. And it's like, oh, that's kind of, you know, or there's old there's like an old Clint Eastwood movie that I I grabbed some reference from because it had like the Hollywood Hills streets and stuff the way that they looked back in the day. Do you, um, know, do you know which one that was? Uh, it's it's that first movie he directed. He's not in it. It's like a oh yeah, breezy. It's called right? breezy. I was gonna say it's yeah. something with a girl's name, like a hippie, the hippie girl. Yeah, it's like Kay, William Kay Holden. Lenz. Yeah, yeah. It's like William Holden is like a old movie producer, screenwriter, or something who lets some hippie girl move in with him. <laughs> it's a really weird, yeah. weird it's movie a, for it to be Eastwood's first yeah. movie, it's unlike anything else he ever made. But yeah, the cinematography in it, they just drive down a lot of these streets. And, you know, so that's, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll you know, find old movies and, and grab a location from that and show it to Sean. I, I think they're all interesting reference points. I, uh, I, I think the first season of Harry O is very interesting for the same reason, if, which is oh, yeah, the first season set in LA and I think the second one moves to San Diego if I remember correctly yeah, yeah but that that which is totally <laughs> makes no sense makes because it shows shows about the the public transport system right you know it's yeah just which I, I lived in San Diego in the 70s there basically wasn't one <laughs> <laughs> yeah no that's a that's a that's a weird show too because it's it's kind of like a, a predictor of of uh, Rockford Files right okay. it's yeah. like they took a really popular actor from another show The Fugitive and you know made him a detective the weirdest thing is when you're watching it and they tell you that he's like in his early 40s or something but he looks like he's about 70 years old uh, absolutely and you're like it's right. no wonder he died just a couple of years <laughs> after that for smoking like nine packs of cigarettes a day or something yeah he, he was the, yeah. no i was just gonna agree with you he's the epitome of the hard living actor that guy yeah he makes about it but, yeah, he looked like a bag of leather. <laughs> he absolutely did. Yeah. Left out, left out, and seasoned. Did you? Yeah. While we're on, while we're on old PI shows, um, thinking that this is the year in which you, in which you uh, create. Did you? Did you? Have you ever picked up any episodes of that show, The Outsider, um, which is the Darren McGavin show from the late sixties? I don't know. I don't know that one. It's, yeah, I it's that. so I, I, yeah, I know all of this stuff with through working with with Max Allen Collins on my camera. He's always, oh, you should check out this, you should check out that. And it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting show. It's like, it's one of Max's favorites. It's a one season show. And I think it's probably 1968. And it's clearly oh, wow. kind of like the, the TV show version of, of um, Harper, if you will. There's, there's, oh, a, wow. re there's a regular sequence, the title sequence is him getting ready, getting ready for his day in his office and getting dressed in his office and having his toast and whatnot, which is an almost direct rip of the op of the title sequence from Harper, right? But it, but it's very, I think you can pick up a couple of episodes on YouTube. It's well worth checking out. Oh, wow, well, I'll check it out. Yeah, I've been trying to find episodes of this show, Coronet Blue. Oh man, yeah, absolutely. You know that one? Yeah. That but great theme. We, I think too. It's, it's Larry Cohen. I it think. is. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, uh, but he claims that the the Born Identity is a complete ripoff of that show, yeah. which 
reading about the show it sounds like it is it's like a guy wakes up with amnesia and then yeah. he, people are trying to kill him and he finds out he's a spy and yeah. he told me the big twist uh, i talked to him once on the phone and he told me the big twist of the show was going to turn out that he was actually a russian spy and and the, the, he was the, from he was one of those guy. fake villages yeah. or whatnot it got amnesia yeah exactly yeah. The, the fake village where they teach you to be an american yeah exactly that's a great concept for a thing <laughs> yeah, and, and, the, and the, that league, that who's that actor? He's called Frank something, I think. Um, yeah, I don't remember who's in it. I've never, I've never seen it. I wanted to get the whole season, but uh, yeah, he he said uh, that was his big his big plan was to build towards that reveal, and uh, but he always wanted to sue the guy who wrote the Born Identity. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it is it is a fascinating show, man. Okay, so I could talk about old PI shows with you forever, yeah. so so I won't. <laughs> Well, just move into my uh, my parting question about uh, about you guys. We talked a bunch off camera about things that we can't talk about here. Have you got anything that you can mention that you're currently working on? Uh, I don't want to jinx anything, but okay. yeah, we've got that. There's... We've got that thing we we just finished a couple of weeks ago. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We did a we did a short story for the Image Anthology. Oh, uh, wonderful! For the December issue. We did a and Sean did the cover for it. So uh the the image exclamation point the anthology yeah. magazine that they're putting out for a year i think only um but yeah sean did the cover and we did a we did a special christmas a, Chris, a criminal christmas story brilliant. <laughs> absolutely brilliant um yeah that um outside of comics you know there's some some a little bit of motion on a couple of hollywood things but you know, like I said, I, if you announce that stuff at all, it, it, it seems almost like a jinx of it not if it's not going to happen. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, there's a I, I have hope that a, a couple things are are moving forward. We'll see. Brilliant. I, I mean, best of luck with those because uh, and uh, everybody that I know who follows your work, which is pretty much everybody I know, really wants to really wants to see it adapted. So uh, you know, uh, but but adapted successfully. You know, yeah. Not, 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 not yeah, no, no, I did. It does after after a while when you it's like, I feel like we've been so close so many times to getting something made that and now it's like now I'm used to working in TV. It's like my my part time job is working in TV. So I'm like, I, I should be able to figure this out at some point. <laughs> you definitely want a, su a successful, lustrous and satisfying adaptation, which yeah. I, I, I presume, you know, you you also need you also need a a, a um, cameo role for the two of you somewhere in the background. Right? Oh God, yeah, yeah. We got a Hitchcock Hitchcock right through the back. Maybe we'll I'll get Sean as a murder victim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean the thing too is though it's like I go back and forth on it. I want I want that stuff for us just to, just for our success and to reach more people. But you know I also never want to stop doing the books so it's like uh on the other hand so it's like on one hand we don't need it because our books are doing well enough that we can just keep doing our books it would be great to have any of this other stuff happen but you know i just spent the last almost the last year working on the batman show and it was yeah. like between doing that and, and working on our books and and friday with marcos i was like oh my god how did i used to do so much stuff when i was younger <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'll just have to start getting younger. That's I'm going the wrong direction. <laughs> that, that is the key thing. And with yeah. with Ethan Reckless, do you think you're ever going to? Do you think you'd ever like bring his story to a halt? But that you tell tell his his final story. But then, do you think when you tell the final story, you'll end it, or do you think you'll tell the final story and then keep on dropping tales of his life in? Oh, I don't know. I haven't thought that far ahead. I, I mean, I know when he's writing the books um you know which we revealed at the end of the third one you see him as the old man writing yeah. the books um but yeah I don't know I don't know I don't know if we'll ever do a last one or not I I, I kind of like the idea that there's no final Parker book or there's no final he, he, as much as he's a sexist no final Travis McGee yeah. <laughs> <laughs> although he did meet his daughter in the last in the last book finally um <laughs> but uh yeah, I don't know. I hadn't. I I I just try to think of them one book at a time. With with reckless, reckless was the first time where I sat down and had, you know, a bunch of ideas. It's probably since when we started Criminal. I remember I my initial pitch for Criminal. I had three or four different, uh, you know, ideas for stories to do book to do graphic novels of. But reckless was so the first. Never, time. Huh? 
Huh? What, what so some of the old criminal stories we never actually got to do. Yeah, some of them we did. I think we've, yeah, I think we've all but one we've we've not done. Yeah, I think we just saw, still haven't done Leo, and Leo's been in prison long enough now. He could just get released. He wouldn't even have to break out. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, but there's plenty to come back to in the criminal universe, right? I mean, oh yeah. I mean, that's the thing with with reckless and criminal. Now, I feel like both of those worlds. I mean, I've I've even thought like, do those do the, are they the same world? Can we have a a reckless team up with one of the lawlesses? <laughs> well, sure. Like, I mean, that knows? just right. Surely that's got to write itself. The title is right there. It's, it's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> less less is less. <laughs> Well, too I'll much be, less. What, too much <laughs> less. Whatever is happening with that, I look forward to it. And uh, guys, thanks so much for joining me. We've been talking about many things, but mainly uh, Reckless, the new Reckless book, Follow Me Down, available from the links here. And uh, uh, thanks for joining us. I look forward to seeing you both again. You too. Thanks. Take care of yourself. Cheers. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.